This is Michael Cowan, and welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. You are the leader in the courtroom, and you want the jury to be looking to you for the answers. When you figure out your theory, never deviate. You want the facts to be consistent, complete, and credible. The defense has no problem running out the clock. Delay is the friend of the defense. It's tough to grow a firm by trying to hold on and micromanage. You've got to front load a simple structure for jurors to be able to hold on to. What types of creative things can we do as lawyers, even though we don't have a trial setting? Whatever you've got to do to make it real, you've got to do to make it real. But the person who needs convincing is you. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Trial Lawyer Nation, your source to win bigger verdicts, get more cases, and manage your law firm. And now, here's your host, noteworthy author, sought-after speaker, and renowned trial lawyer, Michael Cowan. Today on Trial Lawyer Nation, I am super excited uh, that we have John Romano joining us today. Uh, John is an incredible, legendary trial lawyer with the Romano Law Group out of Florida. You've probably heard of him if you're in the personal injury space. Over 200 jury verdicts in every kind of case, including jury verdicts as high as 53 and 45 million and lots of seven-figure ones underneath it. John, how are you doing today? I am doing great, and uh, I'm just glad to be here. This is going to be fun, and I'm looking forward to our chat. It will be. Now, before we get started, I need to say thank you to Law Pods. Law Pods is the company that produces my podcast uh, for me, and they are, they're also a sponsor. They make life really easy because you and I just have to talk to each other, and they do all the recording, editing, uh, putting it out there on the podcast apps and on the internet for us. So thank you to Law Pods. If you want to think about doing your own podcast, uh, I highly recommend Law Pods. Just a reminder that we have my Big Rig Boot Camp coming up in San Antonio, Texas on June 16th, 2023. Uh, you can either attend in person, which is so much better, or we also have a virtual option for those that can't make it. I really hope you can come. This is going to be a great program. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, our nine-step method for maximizing value that Mallory Peacock, my partner, and I came up with uh, in our trucking cases, and actually you can use it for any case. It's really the subject of my book, uh, Big Rig Justice. It's coming out with trial guides later this summer, but we're going to give a, a preview, and we're going to dig deep on how to use it in your cases to maximize value. And also kind of like the mini method, uh, when you have a case where the case value doesn't justify hiring consultants and doing focus groups, but you still want to maximize that case. Maybe you're going to turn a $50,000 case, you want to try to turn it to a $100,000 case, or a $100,000 case, try to turn it to a $200,000 case. We're going to share what we've developed that lets us do that, so you can do that in your firm. Uh, we're going to talk about a new approach to opening statement we've come up with, and a new structure after working with different consultants. We've taken things from them, combined it with our own ideas, and I want to share it with you all. Of course, we're going to do all the basic trucking stuff. We're going to be talking about how to use the federal motor regulations, how to find dirt on co trucking companies, the best industry standards. We're going to show you what they are. We're going to give you copies of them and show you how to use them. But then beyond that, we're also going to talk about, you know, beyond tractor trailers. What if you have a, a company pickup truck? What if you have a Domino's delivery vehicle? How do you find rules and apply them in those cases? And finally, of course, if you have a case where you've got huge damages, but the trucking company doesn't have enough insurance, we're going to talk about other avenues for recovery so you make sure you don't leave any money on the table. So you can sign up now. It's BigRigBootCamp.com, uh, and I hope you join us and hope to see you in San Antonio. That being said, let's kind of jump in uh, to you, John. Um, so you've tried so many cases over your career. You're still trying cases. Still uh, trying cases. Still going at it. Yes. Tell me a little bit about your story. How did you come to be a trial lawyer? I, I always thought of either uh, medicine or law and also knowing I wanted to be a Marine. And no matter what happened, I wanted to go into the Marine Corps. I did that and then made a decision to go on to law school. And while in law school, I immediately gravitated towards the trial lawyering part of it. And we had guests who would come to the law school and lecture. We had Richard Racehorse Haynes, who back in the 60s and 70s was one of the most renowned criminal defense lawyers in America. We had F. Lee Bailey, uh, Melvin Belli out of San Francisco. And as these giants would come in and I would hear them, I was just uh, salivating to be trying cases. And that's what I wanted to do. And then I was uh, 
very fortunate while in law school, as, as fate would have it, the little typewriter that we had, my wife Nancy and I, and we were starting to type up a little resume for me to send out to some law firms. The typewriter was not working, so I wrote a handwritten letter and sent it to Al Cohn, who had been a former president of ATLA, now AAJ, and I told him all the reasons why I wanted to come to work for him. And I, at the very end of the letter, I made a plea and I said, I'm so convinced that, that you will feel soon you made the right decision that I will work for free for six months. Wow. And then a few days later, Mr. Cohn sent me a telegram and it just said, John, deal. Wow. <laughs> and uh, Nancy and I were concerned, maybe they want me to work for free, but, but they didn't. And so I went with a great trial firm. And um, shortly after I passed the bar, um, I was admitted. I, was, um, I will tell you this, Michael, today is May 10th. It was on May 10th, 1974, when I was sworn in as a lawyer. So today is my 49th anniversary of practicing law. And the day that I got my license to practice, I was handed a file. That was a Friday. And on Monday, solo, I started the trial in my first case. And then, as they say, the rest is history. That's incredible. <clears throat> yeah, things have changed a little bit since then uh, as far as the, the willingness to let younger lawyers try cases. Uh, but the, that's, that's a great story. Before I kind of move on from there into how you built your skills, I just want to touch on something you said. You you wanted to be a Marine first. How was your experience as a Marine, how has that, I guess, shaped or affected your career as a trial lawyer? First thing that, that I would say is that when I was growing up, there were figures in my life. Uh, several of my uncles had fought in World War II. And the thing that struck me about them, uh, one in particular, Uncle Al, he was a Marine, he was at Iwo Jima, and everything about him exuded kindness, softness, he was gentle, he was soft-spoken, and yet he was this hero Marine who had been at Iwo Jima. And I would see my uncles who had come back from World War II. I would hear all about the Marines. And then when I was in grade school, my eldest brother joined the Marine Corps. And then it became all the more important to me, uh, the thought of going into the Marine Corps for some period of time. And that's what I decided to do. And it was very important. And what I loved about the Marine Corps is that it was always about teamwork, about uh, pulling your own weight, about um, charging hard all the time, go, go, go. And that has been my life. Um, I'm 73 years old, and I was just telling a friend of mine yesterday, if anything, I am revving it up. That's awesome. <laughs> so that's the way I feel about it. Yeah, it's funny. I talked to friends of mine who aren't lawyers, and or even friends of mine, I have a friend, good friend from, you know, boyhood on who's an insurance defense lawyer and he's yeah, you know yeah. he's already talking we're only 52 he's already talking about retirement plans and, and like i don't want to retire i like what i do <laughs> oh yeah i i am truly i fall into that category of someone who i i feel as though i've never worked a day in my life i i enjoyed boot camp i love the practice of law when i was in sports i love the practices um uh, and uh I've, I've just always been that way and I get very energized around people who are also energized. And, and those who are not, we just try to energize them. Yep. So then you get out of law school, you get licensed on a, on a Friday, you pick a jury on a Monday. Uh, sure what do. do you do after that as the years go by to develop your skills as a trial lawyer? Well, I, I was able to watch a lot of wonderful lawyers in the courtroom and, and be able to see what it is that these men and women were doing in front of juries. Or I would go 
uh, with an elk cone to a deposition and watch how he would develop testimony throughout that deposition. So watching great lawyers had a huge effect on me from day one. And to this day, if I'm at the courthouse at a hearing, when I finish that hearing, I always try to meander over to see who might be in trial and go in and watch a little bit of the trial. Another part of it though, is listening to what other lawyers have to say. So if I go to a seminar, whether the speaker is 30 years old or 83 years old, I know I'm going to learn something from that lawyer or perhaps that medical doctor or, or engineering expert who is teaching at that seminar. I am very high on CLE and how we learn and uh, how we develop our skills. And I especially like the seminars where it's not only the lecture presentations, but where they have tutorials or workshops where you actually uh, are being forced to get up on your feet. But another part of my practice that I was uh, very fortunate to get into early on was the firm I was with really pushed jury research when it was unheard of. So back in the 70s, when really nobody was doing these things called mock trials or focus group sessions, this firm was doing them. And we, we met up with people like Stanley Prizer out of Charleston, West Virginia, and Roxanne Conlin out of Des Moines, Iowa. And I learned what they were doing with mock trials, focus groups, and started doing them. And I saw the magic in them. It's not just a matter of seeing, well, how do these folks pick up on issues that are problems? It forces your team to come together and practice and rehearse. So you're building camaraderie uh, among the team members. It forces you to prepare extra, extra hard. It gets you in front of people. And all that's going to do is help you get better and when I give an opening statement in a trial, it's like I've given it 15 times because we've gone over it time and time again. So that made all the difference in the world and in, in the way I developed. And for lawyers today, uh, and one of the complaints I hear, and I'm, I want to get your opinion on this, they say, oh, well, you know, it's impossible to get trial experience nowadays. That no one goes to trial or no one lets a young lawyer try cases. What's your response to that? I respectfully disagree. I, I, I have heard since I started practicing, one group of lawyers, I'm, there's no, I, they're not, an, it's not an identifiable group. I'm just saying one, one segment of the population of plaintiff lawyers will say, it's so tough nowadays to get to trial. There aren't as many trials. There's a guy over in Tampa, Florida named Bob Joyce, he tries 14 or 15 cases a year. Keith Mitnick out of Orlando, 14 or 15 trials a year. What happens is lawyers for the plaintiff find ways to get out of going to trial. They make excuses. There was a song that came out in 1975-ish. Uh, by Art Simon, and it's called 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. Yeah. And I have told people that every time I hear that song, I keep thinking I'm going to go give a speech somewhere for plaintiff lawyers called 50 Ways Plaintiff Lawyers Do Everything Possible to Get Out of Trying a Case. The problem is at some point you've got to draw a line in the sand. And I'm not saying an unreasonable line because you've got to always be doing what is best for the client. But you advise the client and say, look, let's draw this line at a certain number, because if they don't get to that number, that's not a reasonable offer under these circumstances. Let's go to trial. One of my brothers who's a mediator says the problem is that so many plaintiff lawyers go to a mediation with the mindset, I don't care what happens. I'm not leaving unless the case is settled. And then there's no trial. 
So I, I do believe that you can still try several cases a year, and I don't care if they're big cases and you're a seasoned veteran or if you are a, a rookie lawyer um, going to work in a plaintiff's firm. There are many lawyers around the country now who are trying more than a dozen plaintiff's personal injury cases a year. And I think that the system is is primed for that. Yeah. I used to try 10 or 12 a year. I'm not three or four is about what I want now, just personally. But uh, I think if I had a different firm where other people could work everything up for me and I could just go in and try them, I could try more. But trying, you know, to try three or four, I got to get ready for 10 or 15. Sure, because you're, you've got to handle the Daubert motions and you've got to handle the summary judgment motions and motions in limine and you're taking depositions. And um, I mean, just in the last few weeks, I don't know how many depositions I've taken, but probably about a dozen or so in the last month uh, because we've had two cases in particular where I just had to take a bunch of depositions and we keep doing it. You know, I think one of the big reasons that we, you know, as plaintiff lawyers often don't go to trial is fear. I mean, we're just, we're afraid that it's not going to go well, that uh, that we're not going to do well enough, we're not going to get enough money, or we're going to lose, or we're just going to mess it up at trial somehow. We're going to, you know, how, what do you recommend to people for getting their mindset right so they can overcome that fear and just go to trial? Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I, I was just asked a question I'm in Cincinnati today meeting with experts um, on a product liability case, but just came from a meeting in Nashville. And when I was in Nashville, I was giving a lecture and somebody asked the question about fear. And this is what I told the audience there. Uh, I said, my wife, Nancy and I, we were in a movie one night. It was the, the first of the, Hunger Games trilogy of movies. And there is a scene where the bad guy president, uh, Donald Sutherland, he has his right-hand assistant there. And he says to his assistant, he goes, the only thing more powerful than fear is hope. The assistant says, I don't know what you mean. He goes, what I mean is destroy their hope and they're done. And in a kidding way, I was nudging my wife saying, I, I, I now have this idea. And we later went out to the theater and I told her about it. But here's what I was thinking about when that happened. If you can travel back with me, Michael, we go back to like 1957. There's a, uh, a young man about 34 years old and his wife, she's 34 and they have a 10 year old boy and a seven year old girl and they're all fully dressed and they walk down to the beach and it's two o'clock in the morning and the weather's bad, it's raining, it's windy and they have a huge inner tube and mom and dad tie the kids to the inner tube. And then they tie themselves to the inner tube. And they walk out into the ocean. You see, they're in Cuba. And they're escaping in the middle of the night. And the fear is ungodly. But the hope overrides the fear, the hope that they will get to America and have freedom. And as I was thinking about that, I thought that's a, a, that's where I want to go in my trials from that point on. Fear versus hope. And the problem is, as you suggest, when lawyers are getting ready to try cases, our mind starts working on us and we start going, wait a minute. If we get a zero verdict, the client's going to be upset with the judge is going to tax costs, the other side's costs against us. We don't know what other motions they're going to file. Then we've got to file an appeal. And everybody knows I was in trial. They're all going to ask me about it. And it's just going to be embarrassing and humiliating. We, we, those kind of things 
are playing on our mind. And what I've tried to tell people is it's okay that those kind of things are playing on your mind. That's good because it means you care. It means you're concerned, but you must overcome those problems. One of the Congressional Medal of Honor winners in World War II, Audie Murphy, who became a movie actor and did mostly cowboy movies and war movies, but there was one article about him how during the escapades of one of the battles right on uh, just off of the Rhine River in uh, France, how after he did these extraordinary things, he realized he had um, wet himself and messed himself. He was so terrified, but he just did it. And that's what we must do as lawyers. We must just do it. And I tell young lawyers, don't cave. Once you take an important position, you stay with that and you fight with that unless you're given information that legitimately changes it. But what happens is often the defense lawyers, especially the crusty old veteran defense lawyers, they work on the young lawyer's mind mm -hmm. and they start saying, you're in trouble in this case. You're going to look bad. We're going to come after you for attorney fees. We're going to move for sanctions. And they, they start, um, it, it puts the fear of God in them. So the key is you do it anyway. People of courage are more often very afraid, but they do it anyway. So courage doesn't mean you're fearless or you have no fear. It means you do it in spite of your fear. So, and do you still have to overcome fear? I sure do. No, you you do it all the time. You do it in your, your relationships with people, and you have a hearing. You're going into federal court, and all you've been told is, "I'll be careful here," but let's say not so nice things about a particular judge. And now you've got a hearing, and you go in, and and. It may not be the most friendly atmosphere. You have to go in there no matter what and do a great job for your client. And you do everything within your power to win at that hearing, to prevail. And, and you pray to God that you're going to say the right thing and not make a mistake and go off on some tangent. Yeah, I think it's also, this is sounds weird, but I think it's also valuable to lose a case because the world doesn't end. I mean, it hurts. And, oh, and, yeah. and, and I would never intentionally lose a case, but the first time I lost a case where I had $100,000 in costs and my line of credit was all the way run up, my credit cards were all the way run up, I wasn't sure how I was going to make payroll you know, a month later, but I survived. And the world didn't end. And people didn't start saying, you know, you're a bad lawyer, I'm not going to send you any more cases. It just, you move past it and you go to the next one and you win the next one. NFL teams, when they go play, if you go play in the Super Bowl and lose, you don't say, well, I'm going to quit playing football. You go the next season, try to win it the next season. Oh, I, I know. And, and it's funny. I was talking to a, a lawyer who's up in the Midwest, and he had just had back-to-back uh, -back very significant medical malpractice trials. And the first one, there was a defense verdict. The second one was just a tremendous plaintiff's verdict. And I was telling him after each of those verdicts, call me when the verdict comes in and we talk. And after the second one, I said, I want you to remember the advice that I gave you the last time. When you get a verdict, win, lose, or draw, you have till midnight to either cry about it or to celebrate. And when the clock strikes midnight, move on to the next case. Yep. And if you get a big victory, don't live off that for the next 20 years. I mean, you and I both know lawyers who, uh, the, if, if they lose a case, they not just go down, they go way, way down mentally, emotionally, and they're fearful of going back in the courtroom. The opposite can happen with a really nice verdict. They feel, I don't ever have to try another case, and I will 
speak about this case for the next uh, 30 years. And so, uh, you know, like we, we call in the record business, they call them one hit wonders. Yeah. So one of the things that's fairly unique about you, especially compared to this generation of lawyers, where we have so much specialization is you've tried, I think every type of case. I mean, what, what kind of cases have you taken to verdict? Well, um, you know, wrongful death cases, traumatic brain injury, paralysis cases, trucking, auto, trip and fall, slip and fall, burn injury cases, eminent domain, murder, robbery, um, everything imaginable in, in the civil and the criminal arena. And uh, I, I remember when I was actually when I told you about these great speakers that were coming to law school, one of them was Stanley Prizer out of Charleston, West Virginia. And when he was introduced, it was interesting. They said he had the year before obtained a verdict in Pennsylvania in a med mal case that was the record in Pennsylvania at the time. Now this was back like in the 1950s when he got that verdict. But then uh, later, uh, when I saw him, it was the early 70s, they said he had just come off back-to-back -back trials where in one, it was a product liability case in West Virginia, a record verdict, and then he represented the sitting governor of Kentucky in a criminal case and got an acquittal, and he was talking about that, and he goes, if you are a really good lawyer, you can try any kind of a case. So don't don't think that cross-examining an expert in a murder case is different than cross-examining an expert in a med mal or a products case. The, 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 a lot of what you are doing is the same. Now, the particular strategy or tactics or the language you have to use, um, the procedural rules, they're going to differ. And that got me to thinking, wouldn't that be cool to be trying many different kinds of cases? Uh, back a few years ago, I came off a med mal case, then went right into a case um, where I represented a guy who was with the Greek Mafia out of New York City, and that was a solicitation to commit first-degree murder case. Wow. And then right from there into a product liability trial. And uh, I just find that there are so many similarities. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and commercial vehicle cases. If you have an injury case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us by calling 210-941-1301 to discuss the case in detail and see where we can add value in a partnership. And now, back to the show. I can see how the trial skills have a lot of similarities, but as far as getting up on the subject matter expertise, what do you do to be able to practice at a high level when you're doing products one week and then medical negligence and then trucking and then maybe criminal? Well, it, it, if it is an area where I legitimately go, look, I need help on that area of, of the law. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, in about 1995 or 96, I got a call from someone who wanted me to defend a case in Alabama involving patents and trademarks. And I said, I can't do that. I don't even, I don't know anything about that area of the law. And they said, no, no, what we want is you as a plaintiff lawyer to take the case because we want to counterclaim for patent infringement. And I said, I don't think you're listening to me. I don't know how to do that. So they, after we got to talking about it, I said, I would consider it if you would consider letting me choose as co-counsel a wonderful patent uh, litigation and trial lawyer. And we need to have it. All, not full-time, but almost full-time, a chemical engineer because of what this case entailed to where 
he or she will be at our beck and call until the case is over. With a snap of the finger, he said, done. And I said, well, I'm in. So I did that case, but I knew I need people with special expertise to be like my guardian angels walking me through things. And when we would get into court, if there was a, um, a motion having to do with patent law, I would let the patent lawyer handle those types of things. So that's one way of, of doing it. I, I do not suggest, recommend, or approve in any way, though, of a lawyer going beyond his or her uh, area of comfort and handling some case you got no business handling just because you think you might uh, make a good fee. Uh, be, that's not fair to the client. The client needs somebody who knows how to do that particular type of a case. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I know I'm doing my first Quitom case, but the first thing I did was find a lawyer, law firm that does Quitom cases. And yes, you better believe it. Brought them and in. There are, there are only a few of those around who do it well. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's one thing to try a case, but you've got to have a good trial story. You've got to have your evidence, your discovery done, your evidence all put together to be able to have a story to tell. You know, how do you, you and your firm, how do you prepare cases so that you'll be ready to have a winning trial story? Well, the, the, the story of the case starts around the time of the initial client interview. And I know I do hear lawyers say, well, I write my summation the day of the initial client interview. Well, I've never seen a lawyer really do that. It's talked about. But, but we do have to start putting together the pieces at the time of the initial client interview. And I saw a really interesting an image on the internet about persuasion. And it showed a person's brain as if it was a puzzle with a hundred pieces. And the lawyer was taking one puzzle piece after another and putting it into the person's brain. And the finished product was this beautiful puzzle all put together. That's what we're trying to do from the very beginning uh, when, when we start to handle the case. And the first thing to me in, in cases is preservation of evidence. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating than to get a case where somebody took it, hoped for an early settlement, didn't get the early settlement, and they bring it to you a year later. And you say, did you preserve the vehicle so that we can get the download, have it inspected by um, the accident reconstruction expert, the biomechanical expert, whoever needs to inspect it uh, and have the downloads available. Get the 911 tapes. Did you have someone comb the area to see what was on surveillance tapes, et cetera, okay? It's so frustrating when that happens. I harp on that and we've created a series of checklists on what we need to do in those early stages. The first 24 to 48 hours, the first 30 days, the first 90 days. But while you're doing this, I like to make a call to my trial consultant. And I will say to the juror psychologist or juror sociologist, I want to get you involved in this case now. I get them involved right in the beginning, within a day or two after the case comes to us because they're going to be with me when we're picking a jury sometime later. And then as we move along, you start thinking about, well, your case theme. You know, I just spoke with a trial consultant Sunday. I asked her in front of a whole group of people, typically, when do lawyers come to you and ask you to help them develop the case theme. And she shook her head and said, you don't want to know. I said, yeah, well, we need to know because I'm putting you on the spot in front of all these people. She said, usually it's a few days before trial. And I cringe. I know that you're cringing, but, but you know that's what people do. You start putting together the theme, the case theory, the case image, 
and your thoughts about where this is going within that first few hours and days. And then you start making notes. I'm, I'm a big believer in depositions are trial. A deposition is an event. So every deposition you take should be taken as if you're in trial and you have to win the case with that one witness. That's got to be the approach to a deposition. Written discovery uh, can be very helpful. It's important. But I always tell people, remember, when you send interrogatories, you're basically asking the defense lawyer to provide you with his or her opinion in the answers. And that's really not everybody, but most people, that's what you get. The the opposing lawyer is framing the, the wording as best as that lawyer can. So I could go on and on, but I, but to me, that early preparation and doing it with intensity, that's the key. How about once you get closer to trial, what do you do to get yourself ready? Well, uh, if we get a trial order in, I, I will tell you first administratively two things we do. So let's say today I get an order in from the judge that says, here we are in May, the trial is going to start on the second Monday in November. So we know how many months before trial. One, I send what I call a, quote, do I owe you anything else letter, end quote. That's a letter I send to each defense lawyer saying, I know we get discovery, we get deadlines, we get all these things, but this is me to you. Do I owe you anything else? Is there some interrogatory answer that we haven't provided you with? Is there some document you need? By the way, Joe, I noticed you haven't asked for a defense medical exam yet. Please know if you want one, set it up now. Because what I don't want is we're two weeks before the pretrial conference and you say, Judge, we need a defense medical exam. Because then there's going to be a continue. I want to avoid that. So I send that letter out. The other thing is I have something, it's called pretrial steps checklist, when I'm, which I'm willing to share with anybody who might be listening to this. And we bring in our staff, our team, any of the lawyers who are going to be trying the case and our referral or forwarding or co-counsel lawyer. We have him or her either in the room with us or on a Zoom call nowadays. And we go through everything. Have we done this? Have we done that? Have we done this? Have we done that? We go through interrogatories, depositions, requests for admissions. It takes about an hour and a half to do it right. And we make sure that nothing slips through the cracks. And I let them all know. The judge's order says the witness list is due 90 days before the pretrial conference. Not going to happen with us. The witness list needs to be done two weeks from now. Exhibit list, four weeks from now. In other words, I don't want them waiting for those deadlines. Because then what happens, you wait until um, the deadline, and then two weeks later, there's something that should have been included. It's not. And although some defense lawyers will say, no problem, add your witness, others will say no. And then some judges will say, okay, and some will say, no. I don't want any of that to happen. So to me, that preparation, watching the deadlines and all of that is, is key. Another key is um, I'm very high on deposing um, pretty much everybody. I'm not saying you have to do it in every case, but if it's a malpractice case, product liability, significant injury auto case, someone's paralyzed, dram shop case, I want to depose everybody and you're deposing some because you know you're going to be using those depots to impeach people at trial but i want to get all of those depots done we videotape every deposition i've always said 
If a deposition is worth taking, it must be taken as a video deposition. And to me, that's very important. I depose defense experts on video and we get constantly so many gems in, in movement and body language and, and in many ways. So um, it just it does make a difference. You also use the video to test your case when you're doing your jury research. We do. I mean, the mock trials, having the clips and having them all sync. You know, a, a lot of lawyers, this is something that I guess people have different feelings on this, but I have a very strong feeling. When I take a deposition, at the end of the deposition, I always say, uh, like the other day I had a um, Zoom deposition. I said, all right. Are you want instructions now, Madam Court Reporter? She says, in just a minute. I said, okay. I want, I'm ordering the depot. I need a regular font transcript. This is my old fashioned way of saying it, by the way. The younger lawyers, they have an, even a different lingo because of the technology. And probably video is already obsolete, but I use the word video anyway. But I say, I want the transcript with exhibits attached. I want the video and I want the video synced. I always ask for it to be synced. Among other things, Michael, what that does, it sends a message to the defense lawyers who will report back to some claim specialist that this is a serious lawyer. They're not sitting back saying, uh, if I need the transcript, I'll call you later. All you do when you send that is you let them know you're not serious about going to trial. You're saying, ah, eh, we're really kind of hoping it'll settle and all that. I don't want them to ever feel that way. I want them to know I'm getting ready for trial. And if it settles, fine. But trial is where we're heading in the case. And by doing the order, it makes all the difference in the world by, by ordering the transcript, telling them you want it synced. And then when it's synced, whether you're using it in the mock trial or you're using it uh, at trial to play or to impeach a witness, having it synced is so helpful because it has the wording there. Absolutely. Especially those of us who practice in areas where a lot of people have strong accents uh, or yes. even translating with a translator, having that wording makes a huge difference. Oh, it, it does. It makes all the difference in the world. So once you get to trial, uh, what are some things you've learned? Uh, I've heard you use the terms persuasion and persuasion. What are some things you've learned that uh, allow you to be so persuasive in trial? Well, the most important thing I've learned is that nothing helps more than good facts. And I'm sure <laughs> somebody listening to this will say, brilliant, you know. But I see lawyers who often feel like it's, it's the lawyer who made all the difference in the world in the victory. And my take on it has been it's, it's, the, it's the facts of the case more than anything else that are going to, to tell us um, whether there's going to be a good verdict or not. And the, what the lawyer is doing is acting in some respects as a director and in some respects as a producer and then as an executive producer to bring about what is happening at the trial. But I will also hear people say, the lawyer should never be uh, considered one of the primary actors in the play. And I respectfully disagree with that to this extent. When you give an opening statement, you as the plaintiff lawyer are, as a practical matter, the first witness in the case. I mean, you are able to stand there, talk to them, and lay it all out. So that's not being director or producer. You're on stage speaking the words. So 
that is that is a key. Another part of it is um, it's so important to follow your empirical data. So whatever it is that you learn from your jury research, from your mock trials, focus group, big data. And often I will hear people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm really good about, I know people and better than other people and I have good gut feelings. I go, well, I appreciate that, but I don't think any of us are, are truly as good a mind readers as we might think we are. And uh, Michael, and I, had, I had a trucking case a few years ago in federal court where um, I had a juror, to make a long story short, she owned an insurance agency for three years, but before that was a career insurance adjuster. Her husband, career insurance adjuster. And this was a federal judge who granted me permission to conduct attorney voir dire. So during a break, we're in one of those little witness rooms. I had been talking to another person on the team and I said, she's gone. And I hear this, excuse me, who's gone? And I said, the insurance lady. And he goes, why is, why is she gone? I go, we don't have time for this. Don't even go there. She's all insurance. He goes, this is what he said to me. He goes, you know, Johnny, it's a good thing at least somebody in that courtroom is paying attention to what's going on. I said, go ahead. I'm willing to listen. He says, in spite of that, remember, she is the same age as our widow. Her husband is the same age as our decedent. They have two daughters almost the same ages as our two daughters. And he goes, she has already put her arms around this family and embraced them with all of the empathy, empathetic feelings in the world. We should keep her. We kept her. After three weeks, you hear this knock. As the door flings open, who's holding the paperwork? <laughs> the insurance lady. She's was elected uh, four person and they came out and just spanked this trucking company. And you learn from things like that. So I, I try to tell lawyers, do the jury research, pay attention. When you're going into opening statement, I mean, wow, you, you, you've got months to think about it. And so to me, it's uh, of such an extraordinary opportunity. And in opening, um, I do, in some respects nowadays, use PowerPoint, but that first probably five minutes of opening, I am just, it's just me and the jury. No PowerPoint. I don't want anybody looking anywhere else. I want to talk to them and set the stage. Then we go to the PowerPoint. And the persuasion, there's a great book called Persuasion, and it's all about things that we can do to set the table for the meal to come through the art of persuasion, where, where you are conditioning people to want to uh, make a decision a certain way. And it's an extraordinary book. Um, I would recommend that everybody gets the book Presuade. Could you give an example? Well, yeah. I mean, um, let's take a non-lawyerly example. I have a friend who, let's say, is the opposite of me politically. And I know we're going to dinner with he and his wife one night. And I want to chat with them about who to vote for. But I know if I say, you should really vote for this person. They're going to say, no, nope, wrong party. I'm not going to do that. So I will try to think through what are important things in their lives that matter to them. And as an example, I might say, you know, there's, there's a guy um, here in Florida 
It's, it's really amazing. I saw him recently talking about uh, a trip that he just took with his daughter in this father-daughter organization that they're in where they go on camping trips. And it was so wonderful. And he wrote a poem about it. And I only remember the first part of the poem. So I'll tell him that. And then I'll tell him some other story. And then somehow I'll bring it back to the amazing thing is those are the people that are so wonderful. And we need people like that in office, people who care about those kind of issues. By the way, he's running for office. And wouldn't it be great if we could get him elected? And then theoretically, if it worked, they would go, what's his name? We're going to write it down. We're going to vote for him. They don't even ask what, what party is he with. Right. Well, it's, as you know, it's not that easy these days <laughs> if, if it comes to voting in politics. But that would be an example. You don't just go right in like a bull in the china shop and you say, this is what we're going to do. You wouldn't do that. You are easing the information to someone to set the stage. And then they want to accept the message. To me, it's, it's I'm, I'm trying to put a term on this a few years ago called brain merge. And all I meant by brain merge is if I'm trying to persuade you, Michael, of something, I've got an idea that is in my brain and I want to get it into your brain. So I've got to communicate it in a way where you comprehend it, understand it, appreciate it, and then finally you're willing to accept it, and then you're willing to move on it and make a decision. So that's a part of how I get this idea from my mind and get it into your mind and vice versa. That to me is a big part of what we're doing in persuasion, trying to figure out how to do that. Now, I know you've worked on this for many years and gotten pretty pretty darn good at it, but you can't try every single case. It's, I mean, you've tried over 200, but there have been a lot more than 200 cases tried over your career uh, around this country. What are your thoughts on what, what, I guess, what you've done and what you think the rest of us should be doing on mentoring the next generation of trial lawyers? I, I just know this. In, in my life, I don't know that there's been anything more important than that concept of mentoring. I can tell you this, I, I do believe everything is about relationships and attitude. So at a young age, it was my parents and uh, my older brothers and sisters, and then it was certain teachers. As I moved into high school, it was more selective of certain teachers and one or two coaches that had a tremendous influence on me. And then that moved on. And then I met Nancy. And as my wife, she became a mentor in so many ways to me. The lawyers that I told you about that I went to work with, Al Cohn, mentors. What they do, a great mentor is not only teaching you, but they give you a sense of personal fulfillment to where you feel so much better about yourself and what you are doing and what you are capable of doing. And they, they guide you and a great mentor protects you. There's a wonderful scene in the movie Gladiator where General Maximus his right-hand man, just before the battle scene in the beginning of the movie, tells someone, these big fire-throwing machines, he tells him to change the angle. And General Maximus right away looks over and goes, no, no, leave it right where it is. That's, that's the right range, the right angle. He says it in a better way. That's why he got the Academy Award. <laughs> but... That, to me, was a part of mentoring them in that situation. It's okay. Good. When you are in the courtroom and you're trying a case with a mentoring lawyer, 
that lawyer can say, whoa, whoa, come here, come here. We don't want to be doing that. Or we do want to be doing this or adjust this or change that. And that whole concept is so important. And then there are mentors that maybe we don't have as much direct contact with. But if I'm a young lawyer and I go to a seminar and I hear someone like a Randy McGinn out of um, Albuquerque or Christian Morris out of Las Vegas, Dino Colombo out of West Virginia. They're like a little bit more distant from me because I don't see them every day, but they're mentoring me because they're telling us what they do, how to do it, what not to do. And we learn from their behavior and just watching them. So mentoring is a, a huge part of our lives. And I've always thought one of the beautiful twists in life is that then there comes a time when your children start in certain ways mentoring you. And it's a beautiful thing when you see it in motion. And you practice with some of your children. We do. Yep. Two, two of our uh, sons, Eric and Todd, practice with us. Yeah. And it's a, it's a lot of fun. We try cases together, do depots together and speeches and have fun. And it's great. That's got to feel really good. Yeah, I've been fortunate enough to meet Eric and get to know him, and it's been a joy. <laughs> what would what advice would you give to like a younger lawyer who either is a solo or maybe at a firm where he or she feels like they're not getting a lot of mentorship if they want to find it? Well, I don't care if you're solo, you still need it. Okay. And and the beauty is nowadays you can get it by joining certain organizations and being active and a, a real engaged participant. But if let's just say you're a young lawyer and you're solo and you want to do any kind of litigation, let's say you want to do um, premises liability or negligent security cases. You would want to be a member of your state trial lawyers association. You would want to be a member of AAJ, which is so vital to what we do, these organizations. And in AAJ, there will be a section uh, or a litigation group focusing on negligent security cases. You join that group. As soon as you become a member of that group, they tell you, okay, we're going to have three or four seminars this year. We're going to have a bunch of webinars. But even better than that, we have a listserv. And if you've got anything that pops up as an issue in your cases, you throw it on the listserv, and you're going to have a, the equivalent of a law firm of 500 lawyers around the country who will have ideas to share with you. One of the great organizations take product liability, I'm a member of, of uh, AIEG, Attorneys Information Exchange Group. The listserv, it's insane how great it is. And the sharing of information, which in the end helps the clients. If the client is helped and you get a better result, then it helps the firm, which helps your staff, which helps your family. So solos can be involved and really in a in a very very magical way belong to big law firms in terms of information by being in these organizations. And one thing I that's just makes me love being a plants lawyer so much is how much the even the people at the very pinnacle, very much at the top, will take the time uh without any expectation of getting paid for it to mentor, to discuss. I mean, you know, you might go to like a AJ Trucking Litigation Group or ATAA conference and see some of us up there on stage, you know, speaking. We're also on the phone with each other, helping each other out on our cases. I mean, it's, oh, yeah. uh, and, and, and of course, helping out lots of other lawyers. And, you know, really, to me, there's a great joy in, in doing it, but I also love the fact that people still do it for me. Oh, yeah. No, it's wonderful. I, I would venture to say this that if you took in calendar year 2023, Arguably the 10, whatever they are, the 10 greatest 
plaintiff verdicts in America for this year. And in January of 2024, you are a 30-year-old lawyer and practice somewhere in the Midwest. And you needed help on an issue in a case. You could call the lead counsel in any one of those 10 cases and say, could you have Mr. or Miss so-and-so either get on the phone with me now or call me back. I'm a young lawyer from such and such a state and I need help on something. I promise that person that that lawyer will call them back. I mean, look, the, the lawyer right now at the pinnacle of seemingly everything as a plaintiff's lawyer is Mark Lanier. I talked to a lawyer from Columbus, Ohio, who's about 35 years old. He had a problem on a case, and he told me, he goes, you were right. I called Mark Lanier. He picked up the phone, yeah. and we spoke for about 45 minutes. I said, I'm telling you, because great lawyers, I don't care, plaintiff, criminal defense, whatever, especially, share. Yeah, great lawyers share, and that's important. And yeah, Mark really does live that too. It's incredible. Oh. He doesn't. He doesn't need to do this anymore. I mean, he he collected a multi billion dollar verdict, and I he's know, still no. working just he's as hard, insane. and he's still sharing. He is. He's going night and day. Yeah. Well, I know that we're going to get a lot of people. are going to want to get the, your pre-trial steps checklist. Uh, how do they reach out to you to get that? You know, the, the easiest thing is um, just to email my office. It helps if they email two people. One would be me, and that's john at romanolawgroup.com. And my wife, who also works with us at the firm, nancy at romanolawgroup.com. And that way one of us will see it and we will respond or have someone respond and we have checklists for everything we'll send you any of the checklists you want well i know i'm going to be sending you an email as soon as i get off we have our own but i always want to make them better and you guys do a heck of a job uh, so i'm looking forward to doing that and if you want to learn more about john and his firm uh you can go to romanolawgroup.com you can check out some of the books he's written uh, he's also got a product on trial guides. The, is it the anatomy of a personal injury case? It is. It's called Anatomy of a Personal Injury Lawsuit, fourth edition. And uh, it's two volumes. We have like 35 chapters. And I want to say a total of 40 or more co-authors for the various chapters. And it, it's a wonderful book. Absolutely. Well, John, thank you so much for coming on today. I've really enjoyed uh, learning from you and um, hoping to be able to run into you in person. Are you going to AAJ in Philly this year? We will be at AAJ in Philly, and uh, this has been fun. I'm, I'm just honored to have been a part of this, and it was fun. And anytime I can spend time with you, it's always going to be good. Absolutely. Well, I'll have my wife and kids with me, so my, uh, I, I will definitely come and say hi, but I'm... Uh, Awesome. Going to be mixing the uh, the convention and the the being a husband and father. It's uh, no, it'll be good. Because I'm, well, I'm thank I'm, you. I'm and hoping to have a son uh, son following your son's footsteps and join me here in seven years. He's going off to college wow. in August. So, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, okay, Michael. Thank you for joining us on Trial Lawyer Nation. I hope you enjoyed our show. If you'd like to receive updates, insider information, and more from Trial Lawyer Nation. Sign up for our mailing list at triallawyernation.com. You can also visit our episodes page on the website for show notes and direct links to any resources in this or any past episode. To help more attorneys find our podcast, please like, share, and subscribe to our podcast on any of our social media outlets. If you'd like access to exclusive, plaintiff lawyer-only content and live monthly discussions with me, send a request to join the Trial Lawyer Nation Insider Circle Facebook group. Thanks again for tuning in. I look forward to having you with us next time on Trial Lawyer Nation. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and commercial vehicle cases. 
If you have an injury case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us by calling 210-941-1301 to discuss the case in detail and see where we can add value in a partnership. This podcast has been hosted by Michael Cowan and is not intended to nor does it create the attorney-client privilege between our host, guest, and any listener for any reason. Content from the podcast is not to be interpreted as legal advice. All thoughts and opinions expressed herein are only those from which they came.